Last Saturday, we held the second meeting in a new series of motivational dialogue sessions. These are online meetings where a speaker talks for 10 to 20 minutes on a topic to inspire reflection and conversation. This time, following Rabbi Bob Carroll, the speaker was Betsy Dahl, the president of our US chapter and a climate activist. She spoke about how the experience of the pandemic, or the sudden chaos, as she put it, may impact how we deal with the creeping chaos, climate change. We are very grateful to Betsy for sharing her thoughts and knowledge with us. Thank you very much, Betsy. And we are extremely happy that over 70 people from three continents and more time zones than I can deal with without a piece of paper took part in the conversation. The interest in the meetings has surpassed our expectations, and we will certainly continue the series. You will hear from us soon about the next one. Obviously, we had some technical problems at the beginning, but we are getting better and better with every meeting and try to be diligent about learning from our mistakes. So, thank you for your patience and the helpful feedback we've received, and we promise with each meeting the experience will get better. If you have any suggestions regarding either the conduct of the meeting or future topics we should take on, please let us know. Stay safe and healthy in these difficult times and enjoy the recording of the meeting with Betsy. Okay, so so I'm not an expert on epidemics or the environment, but I speak about what I have observed and more than that, what I care deeply about, averting the worst effects of climate change, having a just, fair society, and the IARF. I imagine that each of you has been affected in some way by the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope it has not been unduly stressful or tragic for you. My family and I are fine under very different uh, conditions, but not terrible ones. So I'm concerned that I won't represent well those who are suffering from this pandemic, but I will focus on how the rest of us can go on from here. One of the difficult aspects of this pandemic is how swiftly it came upon us, forcing us to make changes in our lives at head spinning speeds. Are we working from home? Do we have a job at all? Can we see our friends or family? How are we safely obtaining food? Things can feel chaotic. That chaos feels stronger because we don't know what the future holds. How long will this last? But as you know, another major source of chaos has been creeping up on us and our changing climate on a warming planet. It pops up in various places, huge wildfires here, a drought there, a crop failure, bleached and dying coral reefs, but there's no swab test for global warming as the cause, and we probably don't feel the threat every day. There are parallels between the two disasters, the sudden chaos and the creeping chaos, some of which can guide us and maybe give us hope. One, there are things each of us can do to hold them back. Follow guidelines to slow transmission of the virus. Consume less and burn less fossil fuel in our daily lives. But for both, we need brave, truthful, competent leadership by our governments to steer the course and keep us informed. And we don't always get it. Another similarity, denial. Some leaders in government and industry have known about global warming and its likely effects since the 1970s. Environmental organizations have known too and have tried to inform all who are ready to hear the predictions. But far too many of those who should have been listening, especially leaders, have ignored the information, notably in my country, the US. In the case of the virus, cases were emerging last December and preparations should have been made then since unfortunately we had not planned far ahead and stored enough equipment for the inevitable emergence of a new dangerous virus. My husband and I started a long planned automobile trip on March 1st to visit relatives and a friend in Arizona. 
while sitting in the car, I was Googling COVID-19 statistics from China and, stati <clears throat> and statistics from last year's flu to prove to myself that COVID wasn't much worse than flus we are accustomed to, trying, and I was trying to stay in denial. All is well? Okay. Um, by the time we got home on March 14, we were no longer in denial. We were planning to stay home and indoors indefinitely, other than going for walks. We were ordered to do so by our regional governments a day or two later, and by the state government a day or two after that. And here we are uh, still. Another parallel, a sobering one. In the US, and I think also in Britain I read, People of color have had higher incidence of COVID disease and much higher rates of death than white people. There seem to be many reasons, two of which are higher incidence of pre-existing conditions, that is long-standing health problems such as asthma, and they are much more likely to be working in jobs that have continued during the weeks of sheltering, elderly care, cleaning, driving our buses, and the very controversial meatpacking. With climate change, harmful effects also fall first and harder on poorer population groups and in the global south. Already, longer, more severe droughts are occurring in southern and eastern Africa. Floods are worse too there and in Bangladesh, among other regions with large populations in poverty. And of course, poverty and climate stress compound each other. This is or should be a source of great sorrow and shame for the richer developed countries, especially the US, because we emit much more carbon dioxide than the poorer countries, yet feel the effects more lightly in most cases, in most areas. The major difference between the sudden chaos and the creeping chaos is that with the virus, we had little warning. However, it could be compared to tornadoes in Kansas and Oklahoma. I don't know how, where else in the world tornadoes occur, but you know they will occur. So you can have an underground level to your house and stock it with food, but you have little time to get to that cellar after a tornado forms in your area. With climate chaos, we have had plenty of warning. We have wasted time in denial short-term thinking and reluctance to prepare. For our changing climate, we could not have, not only have prepared, but prevented much of it. And we still can prevent to a large extent. I happened to be at a dinner table last spring with a businessman from Australia. And I asked him why Australia wasn't doing more to avert climate change. He said, it would cost far too much. I wonder whether Australia's, Australians are finding the costs of the horrific wildfires of January and February to be any less. Besides the cost, we fear the needed changes, such as being forced to use renewable energy instead of fossil fuels, maybe to adopt a simpler lifestyle. I'll start my discussion of where we can find hope, hope for positive change with this carbon dioxide. We can look at emissions, how much we are adding to the level in the atmosphere, and the level of what is already there. The website Carbon Brief says the pandemic could cause emissions cuts this year in the region, this number doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but a, a, a 2,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide. Anyway, that means that the level in of CO2 in the atmosphere, the increase, the increase in the level in, in the atmosphere may be only half of what was expected. That makes sense to me. Of course, to maintain a re reasonable conditions, we should aim to have no increase at all or even a decrease. Second, most of us have experienced major alterations in our daily patterns due to this virus. From what I can see among the people who surround me and from reports about the success of, of San Francisco of flattening the curve, 
I surmise that most have accepted these changes for now. Most of the cars on my block do, don't move all week. Parents are coping with the situation where their children are not in school and cannot leave their own small gardens, if they even have one, without parents to supervise their social distancing, etc. Though for many, complying is difficult and comes at a cost to freedom and economic security. To me, however, this demonstrates that people are more flexible and adaptable than we think of ourselves. Third, our government has been distributing a sizable flat payment to most Americans and even more to families with children. This is not the way things are usually done here. A similar suggestion by Andrew Yang last fall when he was running for nomination to be president, to, he proposed that we make this an annual payment that was usually treated as a joke or simply ignored. To me, this demonstrates that our government can be flexible when direly needed. This virus, this pandemic may possibly have given us a, a, a major opportunity for desirable change. Economists are telling us that after such a shock to our economy, getting back to normal will take a long time. Some economists and others are saying that we'll never get back to normal, but recover into some new ways. Many think that in the US at least, more people will continue to work from home more of the time, and more education will take place in the home as has been happening with my grandson downstairs, online. Manufacturers will want more of their supply chain to be in the same country. So maybe more parts manufacturing and other types will resume here. Beyond the, those trends, people having weathered recent major changes in their lives will naturally desire for things to go back to familiar ways, but they may also see that they can adjust to changes more, le, more uh, easily than they feared. Today, in his daily, I mean yesterday, in his daily radio and TV address, the governor of California suggested that we should have a Buddhist beginner's mind about what the state will be, our state of California will be like in the future. In this briefing, he was talking about the state's budget for July 2020 to June 2021. Back in January, that was projected to run a large surplus, but is now projected to run a much larger deficit. So here is the big opportunity. Well, I'll give one more example of this. Uh, there's a, a rather through street, but a not, not the major one, um, that runs across uh, through my neighborhood uh, just to the north of me. And um, a few weeks ago, it was closed uh, so that more uh, cyclists and pedestrians could use it and still have plenty of space to stay a distance from each other. And I now hear that a campaign is underway and I, my son is taking part in it, to uh, keep it closed forever. So that will change the traffic patterns in my neighborhood, but you know, maybe it's a small positive change that uh, sure. yeah. will continue. So here is the big opportunity to think deeply about what changes we want, what changes do we want to forestall, and what parts of normal we're not working well at all. So here are some of my thoughts. In the US, a primary one is we need more income equality, starting with a, some kind of minimum income for all and health care for all. Our responses to the pandemic have made both of these seem much more likely because we have been doing some of it, though it will be a political struggle still. On April 13, the federal government declared that treatment for COVID-19 and testing is free. It's probably hard for people in other countries to imagine how revolutionary there, that is for us. Another, more equality among ethnic groups. As much effort and legal change as I've seen in my lifetime to ensure equality for African Americans, there is still suspicion, even animosity, 
and a lingering, very large difference in wealth accumulation. And most of that was due to 20th century laws that kept black for blacks from wealth. There were many restrictions to their home ownership and no access to the free higher education that white veterans received after World War II. The virus highlights that along with their increased chances of contracting the COVID virus and worse outcomes when they do, African Americans as a group are less able to withstand the economic blows dealt to them by isolation and job loss. We need change. For the entire world, the big change needed is to fully face the threats of climate change, to realize that we need to make significant changes to our lifestyles, especially those of us who are relatively high income and consumption among the people of the world. And maybe this is our chance to stop extracting and burning fossil fuels. Some of the changes I listed before less commuting to work and school, maybe that will mean fewer buildings to heat, less shipping of parts for manufacturing, maybe less consumption of imported goods. And it seems more likely that fossil fuels will stay in the ground when the price gets down to zero, nil, as it did a couple of weeks ago. All of this would be disrupting, though they come with lovely side effects too. Cleaner air, as we've seen, cleaner water, such as in Venice, some return of wildlife. Here's a cautionary note from a New York Times columnist I usually find wise, Roger Cohen. He says, perhaps rebalancing is a useful word because attempts at wholesale reinvention, like utopias, tend to end badly. So rebalancing, such as from consumption to contemplation, from global to local, from outward to inward, from aggression to compassion, from stranger to guest, from frenzy to stillness, from carbon to green. Since I find Roger Cohen to be very humanistic, when he says from global to local, I don't think he means our concern for people around the world. I think he means economically in the way I've described. For the IARF, and as IARF members, what changes do we want to see? I'd like to think that more people have absorbed the truth that I found on a bumper sticker many years ago and have often used as a kind of bumper sticker on my emails. Everyone does better when everyone does better. Your city cannot get to a low rate of COVID infection unless all the sectors of the population have a low rate. I think Singapore is an example that had a sector that they ignored at their peril. This may be a stellar moment to spread the ideal that all are important, whether they are of your religion or ethnicity or of another one, whether they are in the majority or the minority, they have the same human rights as you. I realize that there can be a t strong tendency to blame the other when the kind of stressful conditions occur that we can expect during the recovery, such as a food shortage, but we can steer toward mutual respect and harmony. I know that we of the IARF will come back with heart, with compassion, with open minds. Let us concentrate on being agents of these values in the worlds around us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. It was really, really uh, a good uh, start and good motivational one. Um, I will open the forum for the participants to uh, pour in their questions for Betsy. So please use the raise your hand feature that you have uh, to indicate that you want to speak. And will you uh, call on people, either Jambi or Lucas or something? Because <clears throat> I don't see the features on, on my phone the way I've... Yes, we will. We, yes. Uh, <clears throat> and, can, and don't make so it hard. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't give me hard questions. We, we have Gavin. Um, 
So uh, before you ask the question, may I request you to mention your country and uh, and your name, and then followed by your question. And then, of course, it will be a major project to uh, get that virus to everyone around the world, uh, the, that vaccine, I'm sorry, I'm saying the wrong word, to get the vaccine to enough people around the world uh, to give us uh, group immunity. Um, but uh, without knowing when we will get a vaccine, I, I don't think anybody is making any predictions. I think it will be a pretty long time, maybe, maybe at one year at the least. Uh, Antje, please. Uh, Antje Paul from Germany. And even if we have some medicine, we should go for better climate. And I think we can't do everything at the moment at once, but mm -hmm. we have to go step by step. And everyone can do something. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hello. Hello. I agree. Yes, thank you. I agree. Uh, step by step, uh, and everyone can do something. However, I do think that the biggest uh, cont contributions can be made by our governments uh, in leading us and also uh, setting good. Um, laws and regulations and also the corporations um a group i am in is uh working to get some of the big banks to stop funding to stop making big investments in fossil fuel pipelines and uh extraction and that will make a bigger difference than uh my small efforts, but anyway, everyone's small efforts will can definitely help. Hello. Uh, hello, ma'am. I am Aman Sao from India. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, okay, sir. So I have a question. There is a writer whose name is Yuval Noah Harari. He wrote an article about over the skin and under the skin surveillance system, in which he mentioned that uh, the government of so many countries like China are deploying some surveillance system, which are about to control the biome biometric of human. Like uh, there is a biometric bracelet which they are about to launch in some days, by which they can monitor the temperature of heart temperature of body and the heartbeat of the heart, which are the best way to surveillance a person. But don't you think that it will create a cow chaos with among the pupils? Like they are going to monitor by the government. Government can monitor anything about them. Government can understand what they are feeling. Government can understand what they are thinking, what they are, how they are behaving through this monitoring system of over the skin and under the skin. Um, Lukas, can you uh, summarize that question for me, please? If it's a question, is it a question for me? It's trying to ask you a question regarding the surveillance that Chinese government is using right now uh, through some kind of gadget, a wristband of uh, something like that. So, is this is a right way to surveillance the people? Uh, to, you know, for, the, uh, for a kind of precaution kind of thing for COVID nineteen. Oh, uh, you know, I don't know anything about that. I, I haven't heard about that. So as I say, I'm not an expert on the ep epidemic, okay. but that's very interesting to hear about. And I will uh, try to find out some more information about that myself. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Wolfgang, you wanted to say something? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Ah, okay, yes. Uh, I don't have a really a question, I just I want to have a remark you know, about some positive aspects what we have from the virus as uh, we, we are approaching more. And I, I live in a block with 100 people and we, we take more care as before about everybody. Yeah? 
We can't mm. visit each other, but we are calling each other, and then they say, we see us in the, in the yard and somewhere, and when we don't see somebody, we call, how are you, is everything fine? And also mm. in my religious uh, uh, congregation, I'm Unitarian in Germany, and we are about 500 people living all over Germany, and we don't see us very often. Mm. And now mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a meeting every Sunday. We have a Sunday service, that's never happened before, you know. I'm I'm since uh, I'm a member since 1990, and I can't remember that I have more than uh, three or four services in a year. Yeah? And now we have it every Sunday. Yeah? Even we have, uh, even we are connected with Paris, with Basel, you know. I have a, so we have so our services all over Europe now, and we can participate. So mm -hmm. this is something what we take over after the virus. The taking care of each other. Yes. And That's we have meetings, online meetings on every Wednesday evening. Ah, that's great. Since, since yes. the middle of March. Mm. Well, and, and this is new for the IARF to have uh, open meetings for everyone yeah, sure. uh, online. Yeah. So, uh, yes, uh, some clever people have been looking for good opportunities to make things better for us. Yeah, I love that. Yes, I think especially for small groups that live, uh, that are scattered across a country, a large area, it is uh, great to be able to meet online as well because uh, otherwise they wouldn't be able to meet at all or perhaps only a few times a month because the, the distances are so large. So uh, we are also looking for ways to um, get people more connected. And I think the pandemic will, as we are speaking about so the positive, possible positive outcomes, uh, I think the pandemic may, uh, or as a result of the pandemic, everyone may get more um, accustomed to online communication and find new ways to implement it and use it in everyday lives, which I think is good because this has a lot of potential. So of course we have to strike the right, the right balance between what is online and what is personal and we don't want to give up the personal, of course, no, exactly. but there is a lot of potential, I think, in the, in the online tools that we have since, uh, that we have until now not, uh, not really used. Right, right. Hello. Manoj. Hello. Hello. Hello, please. Hello. Hello, uh, I am Manoj from India. I have a question. Uh, Manish. Manish, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, you're, uh, yes, Hansen, Manish, after, what, yeah, yeah, okay. go ahead. Okay. Uh, do you think that, see, in, in future, the, mera, mera question tha ki, baki student bhi samaj sake, mera question ye tha ki kya aane wale dinu mein, uh, jo bhi ye itra bada pandemic uh, ho gaya hai pura, kya aane wale dinu mein jo country apni responsibility lene ke liye tiyar hongi, unki wajja se ye chiche kuri hai. या देश अपनी गलतियां मानना शुरू करेंगे चाहे पर्यावरण को लेकर डेवलप कंट्री है वो इसके लिए तैयार होंगे कि जैसे ये पर्यावरण को नुकसान हो रहा है और ये कोविड को लेकर जो है चाइना एक्सेप्ट करेगा कि उसकी वजह से ये हुआ है ये चेंज आ पाएगा लोगों में मनीष या हेलो yeah, yeah Betsy. Uh, Manu sir is asking a question. Uh, how many countries uh, are going to step up and taking the responsibility uh, for the environment? You know, it is uh, uh, like China. Is China is going to take the responsibility for spreading the COVID-19 virus? Uh, so he's connecting uh, the, the responsibility for the, the two different yeah. things. Yes. Oh, including boy. the environment destruction. That's, yes, I haven't um, thought about that. I'm, I think that the idea of um, China being responsible is, uh, is a kind of difficult one. Um, yes, it's pretty clear that the uh, virus 
the you know emerged in China. That's where the changes took place. But uh, as best I can tell, that that was totally accidental. Maybe some uh, changes in markets could be made there to keep make it less likely. But uh, anyway, I, you know, it, it's something I think that could have happened anywhere. So I'm not uh, blaming China now. Um, and some in my country do blame China and they have, uh, um, a few have been hostile to Chinese Americans, which is very distressing. Um, now, so I don't, in a way, I don't think anyone can, any country can take responsibility for this virus. Uh, they can say, yes, we were the place where it started, but we aren't responsible, really. But I, I, I hope and I think they are taking good efforts to also help with finding the vaccine, et cetera. Um, now, with the climate change, you, you, the, the biggest countries who are um, using the most fossil fuels have to take responsibility to cut back. Um, whether they will or not, I don't know, but that is what is needed. And uh, I, I certainly hope that our country elects a president who will attend the international meetings and take a fair share of responsibility for the U.S. in that. So we do have a big presidential election coming up in November. And uh, I am hoping and praying for good results. Oh. If I may say something very shortly, I think there is a way we could connect the environmental issue and the virus issue in China. Because as Betsy mentioned, uh, the, the problem was the so-called wet markets where uh, animals were kept in abysmal conditions, you know, in cages piled up one on the other um, with uh, zero hygiene. Uh, so I just yeah. wanted to say before that, I just wanted to finish my thought, if I may that uh, in some way China is responsible because they knew that those markets were uh, ideal, provided ideal conditions for uh, viruses to mutate and to start uh, being uh, dangerous for humans as well because of all the sorts of wild animals that were sold there. So I think uh, also our compassion towards animals and how we treat them and uh, how we look at them as food and machines, and how we abuse them, uh, which is very much an environmental issue, uh, also plays a role here. So, um, and uh, Emmanuel, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, uh, there is one more question coming up from Sony College, India. Uh, the question is for Betsy. Will transitions to renewable energy be slowed or ha halted because of rock bottom oil, pri oil prices and a need to get economies up and running as fast as possible after mm -hmm. COVID-19 related shutdowns? Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> that's a big question. Uh, and I'm glad you raised it, Bob, but I'm, I'm not the kind of, uh, economic expert that could really address it well, but I think it's something we should be watching. And um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I really have much to add. Maybe there's somebody else on this call who, uh, who knows more about how those things will work. I think it is very possible that, that uh, economies, governments will want to take the shortest route toward bringing their, uh, bringing their economies back. And if that is uh, by just going with whatever coal-fired plants or power plants they currently have, rather than going to new ones, that, that very well could happen. Yes, Pascal, you wrote me some time ago that you had uh, something to say. So, Pascal, please. Yes, uh, hello, I'm Pascal Schilling from Germany. Um, there's a big topic upcoming, it's called conspiracy theories all over the world. Uh, mostly in Germany, it's a big point. People are demonstrating on streets and are sharing different theories and um, different points or different groups from society are 
especially coming together, you don't think they would come together because of these theories. Um, you maybe know Bill Gates is a big name in this game. <laughs> Um, but I think for the IRF, it's a, it's a um, really special point and important point that we are getting together with a lot of different religious groups and we all know, okay, there is not this one truth and we all live in different realities. And um, so these people who are yeah, chasing conspiracy theories, they get kicked out of the society or they kick the other people out of society. So they're, they're dividing the society. So my big question to you, Betsy, is and to the IRF, how could the IRF get involved there and to speak about this problem of truth, but not forget the human reason <laughs> and, and science? Yeah. Mm. Wow. Well, um, to my way of thinking, I, I, I had not taken into, I had not given thought much to these conspiracy theories and, and what we could do, but I, it's definitely something I think I, you've raised a really useful uh, topic. Um, and yes, th that is so important and I think it's a lesson that many people are learning, unfortunately, maybe not everyone from this virus, science really matters. You, you have to uh, listen to the, the scientists uh, as well as, any, as other leaders, and they should be on the, the same page. But anyway, uh, yes, it, it, that's what can save us or at least uh, make things better in both, uh, both kinds of the, situations, the climate change and the virus. Um, we have to have deliberate, uh, carefully done research uh, and follow the results. And that will help us much more than anything else, except maybe the caring that uh, Wolfgang talked about uh, among his neighbors. Hello, this is Manohar Dube. I also wish to speak a few words from Please. India. Please. Uh, though I'm not a member at the moment with IERF, but I have an idea and because I'm working here in India on a sort of a small organization recently started. What I feel that the problem in the world is due to the mind. The mind of a person, of the people, just behave like a marketplace. Our mind does not think in terms of selfless activity. Even we talk in terms of taking profit. The small and the smallest things we do with a sort of plus and minus. So until the IARF work on the mind, to correct the business of mind, to make this mind not a business place, but a human word, emotionally correct, we can't improve. This is one point. Mm -hmm. I have heard Bestie and uh, I'm watching the TV and finding that the people around the world are now facing the same problem. Mm -hmm. the, the Corona 19 has united the people around the world. Everyone is having the same suffering. Mm -hmm. And the problem is single. Do you think, can we work to create a united world? the mind has created all type of division in this world. Mm. The USA, the India, the UK and everything. I and you, all, all these divisions are created by mind. Mm. The True. Corona has made one people. Yeah. The question is, can this organization work to dilute the activity of mind, working on mind? That's mm. the, my suggestion and a sort of a feeling which I want to share with you. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. Manu, Manu, Manu Soni has asked me to join this uh, meeting at the today. So I want to thank him. And what Besti has said, is something very, very important. But until we work on the mind, until the people start thinking in terms of world as a whole, mm -hmm. things cannot improve. Mm -hmm. so how can we make this world as a one unit 
as we are now feeling with the coronavirus as a one unit. The blame game that who is responsible for what is not very important because it is a sort of a division. Right. If we right. think as a whole, nobody is responsible. And every one of us is responsible. As, yeah. as Besti has said that she is comfortable. I'm, I also feel I'm comfortable. I'm not able to represent the whole mankind at the moment because I have all sort of uh, facilities with me. Right. But definitely people are suffering. The chaos, the uncertainty. All those things are to be addressed in a very different way. Breaking the boundaries of religion, breaking the boundaries of the country, uh, breaking the boundaries of ethnical groups, and all, all boundaries. Can we work for that? That's the question. Will this uh, give an opportunity to think in terms of one world? Though it's a difficult task, but could we start to work for one world? That's, that's my suggestion and question both. All those guests here appearing, can they think? Can they put their bid to make this world as one? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, that's a, a great point. And uh, my, my only quick thought about how can we promote that is just, just to keep reminding people in any opportunity that we have that yes we we see how we are all one and i gave a small example of everyone does better if everyone does better i say within your city you will do better if everyone is helped to do better and not get the virus but it's uh, true also for the entire world the entire global population it, this uh, if there's or if there are two or three countries that have a severe uh, epidemic still, then the rest of the world w will have a very difficult time recovering uh, the health because we are so interconnected. So I think we need to uh, hold that up and, and remind everybody of it in very much the way you just uh, expressed. We are one, really, truly we are one, one people. Uh, I can see that some people want to speak. Uh, some uh, couldn't find the raise your hand option in Zoom and wrote to me. So now I will ask Julia, uh, would you like to say something? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Julia. I'm from the US. Um, uh, what I had originally planned to say, I think, was said much better um, by Mother Har. So thank you, for, thank you for those words and Betsy for your response. Um, along the topic of sort of globalization and the ways that we are all interconnected, um, I think that I want to also think about the way that like media and information spread sort of to like what Pascal was saying, um, in that I think, I think regarding the beginnings of COVID, it does, we cannot blame one country for creating the virus. Like actually I work in public health. Um, and so a lot of my job involves um, like working around, I'm, I'm not a clinician, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, um, but I do research on um, infectious diseases. And so I have access to more information, I think, than some of the general population in the U.S. And what we're, we've actually found is that the wet markets themselves in uh, Hubei province um, are not to blame, are not to blame in general, but are not the source of the disease, but rather that there were a few people who already had COVID and then went to the wet market. And then because they interacted with people, um, like that's where all those cases came from rather than coming necessarily from the animals themselves. But I think that's a really good example in terms of when we think about conspiracy theories and other information that isn't 100% accurate but has nonetheless been held as truth. Um, and so I was wondering what, as, as the IRF is setting up these calls and discussions. Betsy, what do you think about the IRF being perhaps a vehicle for 
gathering and spreading like reputable information like is that a role that we could potentially have we have people from all around the world um with all different backgrounds and like expertise um do you think that's a kind of resource that we could try to be uh it's it seems a little different from what you know what we have seen of our mission in the past but i think it's definitely worth um worth considering and i i think that would be uh, particularly for the council to decide uh exactly what um kinds of things the irf will do um but as, when it impacts on a uh, when it because it relates to this idea of of that of truth and exploring different um, perspectives on the truth I think that uh, that it actually does it would be very uh, very uh, interesting and maybe uh, beneficial for us to try to uh, assist with that yeah getting the the right information out there uh, yes, maybe. Uh, all, Robert, uh, the president of IRF, was also with us, wrote to me some time ago that he wanted to say something. So this would be, I think, a very good moment. Robert, are you still with us? Uh, Robert, if you are here and have some troubles, pre please write to me on the chat. And meanwhile, I think uh, Wolfgang wanted to say something. Uh, no, maybe no. Wolfgang, uh, later, Derek has... Oh, no, it's not hand me. Raised. It was just... I just tested my other computer. Sorry, can I interrupt? Sorry. No, no, not pro yeah. not a problem. Derek, would you like to say something? Yeah, hi, Betsy. Yeah, Derek McCauley from the UK. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, in in many countries where we operate, clearly a religion um, is is very important to separate entities. And during the pandemic, there have been instances where religious groups have, for whatever reasons, been targeted either because of their response to the pandemic or the fact that, the, as in France, where the pandemic took hold in a large religious congregation and then was spread around Eastern France, um, there are other instances around the world. Um, so that's a very dangerous situation and is clearly not scientific. But if you look at climate change, um, it's, I can easily see as the climate change issues get more uh, difficult, and you have issues around water and access to water mm -hmm. that religious identities again could become um, uh, important. Mm -hmm. um, the Rohingya Muslim Muslims in, in Burma have suffered because of, uh, and, and I think access to resources is part of that. Oh, um, so what, you know, I think that's a parallel that is, is quite pertinent and, and for the future and in a negative sense. And what can IRF do about that? Well, that's uh, that's another great issue, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that would take a lot of thought, and uh, probably by better minds than mine. But uh, I, the one thing that comes to my mind is is continuing to talk about human rights every human has a right, has the same rights. And uh, it's, yes, I, I, as things become, that's, that, that is a real danger. That is, as the scarcity, as various vital resources become scarcer, competition will lead to uh, not more cooperation, but more uh, oppression. I think that is a big, big danger of climate change. So, it, that's something we should be keeping our eyes on and, and thinking about. Uh, uh, is there someone uh, who would like to say something? We will be wrapping up the meeting in about five minutes. So there's still some time. Uh, Garvit, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Garvit Solanki. I am from India. I have some uh, good, work, uh, good words on that. Uh, there is a substantial data to show that if a person is exuberant, joyful and wonderful, their immune system is always functioning at a better level of protection than those who are 
depressed and worried about something mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. patient serious you do not have to become serious if i am not serious that does it means to say i am going to be flavorous no you are just going to be joyful responsible and sensible uh, such a human being can deal with situation much better than those who are dead serious about everything mm-hmm. and especially if you are in panic you are paralyzed right now it is very important that all your faculties are in place and your body and brain function at respond the way they need to yeah that is that's a great insight uh and yes if we could promote that kind of joy and uh positive feelings among people that that would be a great service in and of itself yes thank you very much carvit i think robert may be able to speak now i've seen can, him can now. you hear me now yes we can <laughs> okay. i'm Hello, sorry robert. everybody i i got a new microphone and it's uh, it's been a bit of a problem um what i wanted to say uh, uh, it's more of an observation but but betsy please respond if you can um the way of dealing with uh climate change in in past times has been to mobilize international opinion and, and to talk in an international forum and for religious freedom um the way of fighting it has been to bring international pressure on those who are uh denying it to their populations but since well before the advent of uh, of covid uh, um, the world uh, many politicians were becoming more um what should we say looking inwards look at rather than looking outwards and of mm-hmm. course since the uh, since covid everybody's closed the borders and they've all looked inwards and become very self protective and so we have this problem now that we've got to break out of that inward looking mode and become an international community again if we're going to solve all these problems uh, and that i think is our biggest challenge and it, it's a challenge that is getting worse rather than better so uh, if anybody wants to comment on that then uh, i'd be uh, very happy to hear what they have to say mm. Well, thank you Das. Yeah. Oh, sorry but please go. I was on. just going to say I don't have any particular words of wisdom but that is another uh you know another great uh topic to think about. Yeah. I'd love to hear of others. Is there someone who would like to say something? Please you can just unmute yourself and speak. You are muted yourself. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Hello. So I'm first time on the meeting of IRF on on online and uh, I think what IRF could do would be prepare structure for the previous action because the in all these problems were which Betsy listed the action is highly required and for this action we need to build our connection so for me uh, i would like to know maybe more about other members of irf about their problems to feel more connected and more familiar with their uh, community and then we could be more nearer each other so i think uh, this uh, this uh, meeting would be it would be the first step for the next action if only wukash uh, makes it further uh, and thank you very much for for being letting me be with you uh, thank you very much justina for your voice the um what is coming to mind uh 
when I hear both Robert and, uh, is it Christina? Um, you talking that. about yes. being more, uh, being more connected, more of an international community. I just think of the small scale um, thing that is happening that Wolfgang talked about in his uh, uh, residence block, where people are showing more care for each other and more concern for each other and um, speaking up and, and uh, trying to connect with each other locally, just somehow to carry that attitude and saying this can be use it maybe as a little mini model of of how we need to be as an international community exactly how we um, convey that i'm not sure but um, you know i think every facebook post makes a little impact um, and we can talk about community and of caring on on every level Uh, thank you, Betsy. I think we will be wrapping up slowly. Uh, it's been over an hour now. Uh, so uh, maybe we have time for one more voice. If there is someone who would like to say something, uh, please, uh, you can unmute yourself and speak. Yes, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Hello, Esther. Yes. I want to go back to Pascal, what he said, because what he was describing, uh, uh, what happens in his uh, background, is actually the same discussion in the uh, German-speaking part of Switzerland about this conspiracy theory, etc. And uh, the problem we were discussing about it is that populist ideas, simple reasons are um, very common. That means people want a simple reason um, because they are afraid. So in fact, it's necessary to, to, uh, to approach them where they have fears and not with the simple ideas. And so um, all the reasons, we don't know yet really where the virus comes from. Recently, I heard, I read that also in France, already in December, they had a similar virus. So it's really not yet possible to, to say definitely where it comes from. So we cannot blame any party, any country. That is one thing. And I think the media have a very important role whether they use it in a good sense or not. And me personally, I am with media, so I'm watching what's going on. And I also try to, to spread um, positive um, reasons. Um, I will do it <laughs> in, within a few days again uh, about the subject which happened two days ago and la yesterday. There was a webinar from United Nations in New York. 2,000, more than 2,000 people from all over the world participated because of the Jubilee of 75 years. And you know that it could not be celebrated in the way that it was planned. So they found a way of a two days seminar under the title Together First not Switzerland first, not America first, but together first. And they are really now trying to, to reach the basis, not the governments first, but the basis, the no, uh, NGOs and other private sector to, to include so that they can gather a lot of um, ideas, suggestions, in which way in future, in the next future, that um, the United Nations can direct themselves because they want to make changes. Since a long time they want it, but it was not really possible yet how they want it. So the basis is now included and I see a chance because I, I am from a religious background just to bring in a different a point of view which comes from a religious background. 
Yeah, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. I think we will be closing the meeting. Uh, I would like to thank everyone and, of course, our speaker, Betsy, most of all. And uh, thank you for joining us for this bumpy ride. Uh, we are sorry <laughs> for all the technical problems, but with each meeting, we are getting better at it. So we hope that the next one will be really smooth and uh, we hope to see as many of you there as possible. Uh, please, if you want to, go to, IR, uh, as you can see on the screen now, to irf.net slash poll where we have a few questions for you about the meeting and also if you want to give us your email to stay in touch and uh, get updated on future meetings so please uh, if you have uh, just a few minutes to uh, help us uh, with your feedback and ideas please go to irf.net slash poll irf.net slash poll thank you very much Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. And hopefully see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.